Thank you, thanks for having me. So the picture you see behind me are the faces of firefighters who are looking at a wildfire in um, Northern California in September 2015. And I could have chosen pictures of, um, of the wildfire itself, of the damage to property and, and vehicles and so on. But I was really moved by this picture of their faces, that the amazement and awe of experienced firefighters as they look upon this blaze. And what struck me about it was that this is the kind of look that many of us have as we see the world changing around us because of global warming. We now know that um, hurricanes are getting stronger, that wildfires are not only seasonal but can happen year round and that uh, they, they burn hotter, that uh, rainfall is torrential, uh, uh, you know, sort of commonplace rainfall, and that um, and that droughts last much longer than we thought they would. And many of the things that we've been discussing today, like gender equity, like sanitation, and, and, um, and anything that has to do with human life that's already tricky or imperiled is worsened by climate change. It takes your problems and puts them on steroids. So you would think that the way the world is changing right now, that uh, people, especially educated people, would accept that climate change is happening and it's happening now and you would be wrong. Because in the United States, which is the second largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, denial of climate change is an acceptable public policy stance and it's you know, acceptable at your dinner table and in good company. So um, there was a poll, a 2015 poll, that showed that majorities of Latin Americans, Africans, and Europeans accepted that climate change is happening today. Only 41% of Americans think that. The, uh, our, one of our two major parties, the Republican Party, uh, basically has denial of climate change as, one, as part of its political orthodoxy. The, um, uh, the current Republican uh, candidate for president, Donald Trump, as you can tell, ha thinks climate change is a hoax. In May, he said that if he's elected president, and that, that is a possibility looking at the polls these days, um, he said that he would pull the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement that was signed last year. Now, if that's the case, any idea about a sustainable future, you can kiss goodbye. So the question is, you know, here's the United States, the, this, this bastion of scientific innovation, right? You know, you got Apple out of there, Microsoft, Uber, you have universities that do cutting edge science. How did the United States become the seat of climate denial? It's like denying gravity. Well, and this is where journalism comes in. Climate journalism, until recently, had been about explaining the science of climate change or explaining the impact. Now it's up to us as journalists to start talking about the barriers to action on climate change. And that is what, um, what journalists and, and researchers and advocates began a few years ago, and that is um, something that we at Inside Climate have continued recently. So let me tell you where we started about a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago, this is what was known about obstruction on climate policy in the United States. Researchers had shown by looking at public documents like tax filings and so on, that, um, that the reason denial was so widespread in the United States was that in the early 90s, America's largest manufacturers and, and industries led by the oil industry um, gave millions and millions of dollars to organizations that um, churned out reports casting doubt on climate science. The same companies also uh, gave money to the election campaigns of politicians who denied climate science. So all of a sudden you have this infrastructure of doubt that's created, right? There are these reports that are published, there are politicians who cite those reports and everything looks respectable and reputable. So inside climate news where I work, um, and, and, and it's created this kind of, this, this uh, confusion that you see in this, um, in this graphic, right? That 97% of climatologists accept that climate change is happening and only you know, about half the American population. So they were very effective in what they did. Inside Climate News, where I work, is a new model of journalism in the United States. We are a nonprofit, right? There's only a dozen of us. We have a, a, a tight focus on climate change um, and, uh, and accountability in climate change. 
Uh, we, um, you can find who our funders are on our website, but our funders, let me just be clear, do not tell us what to do. Right? They might be interested in climate change. They do not call the shots in the stories we write. Um, and, uh, and we're lucky to have philanthropy supporting us, and we're lucky that we don't have corporations and advertisers to answer to. So about um, a year and a half ago, we decided to, we asked the question, well, you know, did the fossil fuel industry always doubt climate science? I mean, fossil fuel companies have the money to hire some of the best scientists in the world. So we started looking at companies in the United States, and very quickly, we found out that, um, and we thought that you know, maybe they were interested back in the 1990s or something in, in climate change, because that's when the rest of the world had picked up on it. We found out through our research and through documents that in fact, there was a, a company that led in climate research that was looking at climate research when a very small number of scientists were looking at it in the 1970s. And that company is Exxon Corporation, now known as Exxon Mobil, known in some parts of, of the world as ESSO. So Exxon, as early as 1977, had one of its senior scientists tell its board of directors, you know, these are the guys who run the company, they don't have a whole lot of time, uh, told them um, that uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was increasing. It was increasing because of the burning of fossil fuels. This was going to warm the planet and it was going to create grave consequences for much of humanity. This is one of the documents that we found. Um, you can see the word catastrophic. That word was used several times. And so what, what Exxon decided to do in the late 70s, they realized that if this was going to happen, if the science was true and it was looking pretty true, then there was going to be a policy response that the governments were going to act to cut uh, to, to make companies cut emissions. So they wanted to have a seat at the table when this decision was made. And they thought the best way to do it was to have, was to perform rigorous peer-reviewed science so that they could help shape policy going forward. And that's what they did for about 10 years. And um, they, they actually outfitted a super tanker with equipment to measure CO2 in the atmosphere and the ocean as it went from the Western Hemisphere to the Persian Gulf. They did climate modeling. The government and academics thought that they did cutting edge work. And this continued until the late 80s. And then in 1991, everything changed. What happened then was that Exxon, not just the oil industry, but really Exxon and the American Petroleum Institute, which is the, the lead uh, lobby in, in oil lobby in the United States, they headed up this group, the Go Global Climate Coalition, that for years cast doubt on climate change. And that's why, you know, to this day, we, you've had two or three decades pass with little international action on climate because the United States has stood in the way. They've been very effective in what they've done. So our, our series ran in September of last year, and at the same time, a separate independent series uh, ran in the Los Angeles Times about uh, Exxon's activities in the 90s. Ours was mostly in the 70s and 80s. So it, this could have happened and, nothing, and just sort of floated off into the ether, if not for the fact that attorneys general, starting with the attorney general of New York State, decided to investigate Exxon for potential fraud. What they've done is that they, starting with um, Eric Schneiderman, who you see here, who's the Attorney General in New York, and now 18 other Attorneys General, have issued subpoenas to Exxon about you know, um, what they knew about climate change and what they did with that information. Because basically, if you know that there is a threat out there affecting your business, right, affecting your bottom line, and you don't tell shareholders about it, that is potentially fraud. So the investigations continue, and then this last week, the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States has also launched an investigation. And, you know, people ask me all the time, well, is this like big tobacco? Is this, you know, did Exxon commit fraud? And I, I, I don't know. I really don't. I don't have that information. Maybe the attorneys general will get it. Um, it's up to the courts to decide ultimately. But what this whole project, I hope, has shown you is the role that the media can play, right? What we do, what we do is we ask questions, and we ask them over and over again. We may not have all the answers, but in asking the questions, you take the first step towards accountability. And when it comes to a sustainable future and the SDGs, in asking these questions, you know, what you do is you start a discussion and you get people to focus on things, especially the things that are standing in the way of, of action that you know could change things for the better. 
And you know, right now our role is that in the United States and we hope that, you know, that we see this kind of activity in other countries as well. Thank you.